Roads and Boats, How to Set Up and Play. This is a civilization game with an emphasis on logistics and especially transportation. One of the main concepts of the game is that there is no territory. Uh, you cannot own land or buildings, so the things that you build can be used by other players. The game is played in a series of turns. Each turn has four phases. First, we'll produce livestock or goods or new transportation or research. Then the movement phase, where players will move goods across roads and bridges and water. Then the building phase, where they can build new buildings and factories uh, to draw resources from the land or convert resources. And then finally the wonder phase, where we all contribute bricks to this common wonder we're building that will help influence our wealth points at the end of the game. Here are the main tiles in the game. Uh, these are pasture tiles, wood tiles, rock, mountain, deserts, which no buildings can go on, and sea tiles. You'll see they also have a variation where a river uh, cuts through each of the territories. This is an important one because this is considered a source of a river. Here are all the icons and pieces for the game. So you've got your three main types of land transportation, donkeys, wagons, and trucks. And then you have three types of water transportation, rafts, rowboats, and steamships. You also, players have walls that can be used to protect some of their territory. But walls can also be destroyed. Here are all the goods in the game. Trunks that are produced by woodcutters. Boards that come from sawmills. Paper from paper mills. Uh, goose uh, reproduced from other geese. Clay comes from clay pits. Stone can come naturally from quarries or be produced in stone factories. Fuel can come from oil rigs on the sea or from coal burners on the land. Iron comes from mines as do gold, and you can see gold uh, represents wealth points, so victory points at the end of the game. Coins are produced by a mint, and stock certificates, uh, 120 wealth points, are produced by a stock exchange. These are the goods in the game. They are typically produced by the buildings in the game. Uh, the woodcutter and any building with a circle indicates a primary producer. It draws its resources from the land or the earth. Whereas this doesn't have the circle, it's called a secondary producer. It requires inputs to produce its goods. So a woodcutter uh, produces trunks if a woodcutter is built on a certain tile in woods. A sawmill converts boards uh, out of trunks. Paper mill produces paper out of trunks or boards. A clay pit produces clay. It has to be on a shore, either a seashore or a river shore. So if it's on this tile, that's a shore. Or if it's on a river, that's considered a shore. A stone factory produces stone out of clay. Quarry produces stones. It has to be built on rocks. An oil rig produces fuel but it has to be uh, built in the sea. And a coal burner produces fuel out of trunks and or boards. And then there's mine, mines that produce iron or gold, and they need to be built in the mountains. A mint produces coins out of gold and fuel, and a stock exchange produces stock out of coins and paper. In addition to the buildings that produce goods, you've got buildings or factories uh, that produce other transportation. Um, a wagon factory produces wagons out of donkey and boards. Uh, the truck factory can produce a truck out of iron and fuel. A raft factory can produce a raft out of wood trunks. A rowboat factory can produce rowboats out of boards. And a steamer factory can produce steamship out of iron and fuel. You also have resource, research uh, that can be gained throughout the game. Every player will start with a, a resource research board. So in order to produce rowboats, you first must have researched the rowing technology. It enables you to build a rowboat factory. 
You have to have trucking to build a truck factory. You have to have shipping to build a steamship factory. You have to have drilling technology before you can build an oil rig. And then you've got some mine specializations. So to start the game, every player can build a mine, but it will only have a mixture of three gold or three iron. This specialization allows you to make it exclusively gold or iron. This one allows you to build bigger mines or build new mine shafts with more capacity, five each instead of three. And this technology is actually required to actually add new shafts to mines. So once a mine's resources are exhausted, um, it won't provide new resources until a new shaft is added. And then the bright idea is used for the expansion. So to set up the game, create a supply of all the goods and resources, and then you set up the Wonder Board. The Wonder Board is used for several things. First, during the Wonder Phase, bricks can be added to the Wonder Board, and those will provide victory points at the end of the game. It's also a timer for certain things in the game. Once the first brick is placed here, each new brick costs two resources instead of one. When the first brick hits here, all deserts transform to pastures. So no buildings can be built on deserts, but eventually irrigation happens and they convert to pastures. Also, it's the timer for the game. So when the brick gets here in a two-player game, the game ends and victory points are tallied and you see for higher player counts. In a solo game, you skip the first four rows and the first brick will get here. So in a solo game, bricks start at a higher expense and it plays for a precise number of rounds, exactly 20 rounds. So when the 20th neutral brick is placed, uh, the game will end. It does not target a specific uh, endpoint. Also, this is also the way to track the current turn order. Most play happens simultaneously, but if there is a competition for resources or the use of a building, then the turn order is enforced. And this is the temple that will use, be used to uh, reset the turn order. Next, you create the map. Uh, the map can be created using a um, pre-configured map out of the scenario book, or a different way to do it is just to create a map from scratch. This is a map I created from scratch. Basically, each player will place two tiles, two land tiles, uh, the only restriction is that they have to border an existing tile already on the, the board. And then you'll just go clockwise, each player placing uh, two tiles. All right, so let me clarify that. So a player can place any two tiles as long as they border another one. As a general rule, you'll want to use about 10 land tiles per player. And that'll be a good uh, rule of thumb for how big the board should be. So use about 10 land tiles per player and then any number of sea tiles. The more sea tiles you use, the quicker you'll encourage uh, interaction and conflict around the player. The only other rule when placing tiles is rivers. Rivers have to either come from the source, from the mountain, or be connected to a sea. So you can have rivers connecting into two seas or into a source mountain. Also, rivers can't run off the board. So once Everyone has completed the map, you put the plexi on it, then you can randomize the starting turn order. You'll see this matches the same exact sequence down here, and we'll talk about how that changes. And then you can either, as a group, determine the starting places, or in turn order, going clockwise, select your starting position. Any land tile on the board, uh, you have to be at least one hex away from another starting player. And as a tip, generally make sure that you're at least near stone, pasture, and woods to get the resources at the beginning of the game you need. The starting resources for each player all get placed on their starting tile. Uh, three donkey, five boards, two geese, and one stone. I'll also be referencing this player aid a lot that covers all the different phases and buildings in the game. And you can see the setup there, three donkeys, two geese, one stone and five boards. There's several really nice player aids depending on your preference. So here's how turn order works. Most of the time play will happen simultaneously and only if there's uh, a conflict over a player wants to get or use resources before another player or take advantage of a building do you actually play in the sequential order. So this is considered the temple. 
uh, the blue player now is considered to be in the front pew at the temple praying, whereas the yellow player is in the back pew, allowing them to get out and tend to the uh, mundane orders of the world. So yellow player will go first, then red, then green, and then blue, and you can see that matches up there. So at the beginning of any phase, a player can call for a turn order change. It has to be declared before the phase starts. Uh, and then basically, what would happen is that these would come off, and then blue player has the right to move to the back of the church, which would give them a higher turn order position. So they may say, yes, I now want to move back here. Green can decide to take the next position available or reserve their right for a future round. And red might move in there, yellow moves there, and green there. And then we just change the turn order based on that. Blue, red, yellow, green. You could have someone call for turn order in a subsequent round, or a subsequent phase, actually. This can happen every phase. Typically, you reserve your right for when you really need it. So the yellow player might call for a turn order change, and green says, no, I still want to stay at the front of the church. I'm going to stay where I am. Whereas yellow, it's really important that they come down here. Red would decide next, and then blue. So that's how that works. One small rule is before the production phase, before you declare a turn order change, you can actually see what the random output from the mine is going to be before you make a decision about calling for turn order change. So the game will end when the last brick is placed based on the player count, or again, 20 exact rounds in a solo game. And then we add up wealth points to your contribution based on how many bricks you have in the row, along with wealth points that come from gold, coins, and stock certificates. And then most wealth points wins the game. So let's cover each of the phases of a turn, the production, movement, building, and wonder phase. So here are the phases on the player aid. You can see production, movement, building, and wonder. In the production phase, uh, these can happen simultaneously, but we see there's livestock reproduction, uh, goods and transporters are produced, research can be produced, which would lead into potential factory upgrades. So let's cover livestock reproduction first. So there's two types of livestock in the game, donkeys and geese. In order to reproduce, you have to have exactly two of the animals in a pasture hex all alone. So there can't be any other buildings, any other resources, any other animals in this hex. The only thing that is allowed, you can have roads connecting the hex or maybe a wall dividing the hex. Your starting token also does not count as a building, so that's fine. So during the production phase, if you have two alone, they would produce exactly one more offspring. And that would be the same for geese. Now, if this was the situation in the next round, these would not reproduce because you have three. You have to have exactly two. Or, if there was a resource, they would not produce. So again, the livestock have to be alone, in a pasture, with no other buildings or goods. One other point is that the owners of donkeys, the yellow player in this case, can decide whether they reproduce or not because there is a limit on the number of transports you can have. You can have a max of eight transports in the game and only five of one type, land or water transports. So you may decide you do not want your donkeys to reproduce. Also keep in mind that deserts later in the game will convert to pastures and at that point, they can be used for reproduction or actually putting buildings and other things. The next thing that gets produced uh, during the production phase are goods. And there's two types of goods. Uh, there are the primary producers that produce and there are the secondary producers. Now in the very first phase of the game, production actually will get skipped entirely because there are no buildings in the game and no movement has taken place. But let's say we're in the second turn um, all of the producers that were built in the previous turn will produce. So let's first talk about the primary producers. The primary producers have to be built on a corresponding tile. A woodcutter has to be built in the woods. A quarry has to be built on the rock. A clay pit has to be built on a shore, either a land tile 
next to sea or a land tile with river. Uh, the oil rig has to be uh, built in the sea and the mine has to be built in a mountain. And primary producers will produce exactly one output every production phase. So for example, and keep in mind the circle indicates that these are primary producers. They draw from the land, not from inputs. So a quarry, assuming it was based properly on a shore of a river here, uh, every round, I'm sorry, this is a, a clay pit, every round would produce a piece of clay. And it has unlimited capacity. So every round it would keep producing whether anyone was here or not. This column indicates the cost it required to actually build the building during the building phase. So to build a mine, it takes a stone and three boards to build the mine. The woodcutter will produce one trunk, quarry, one stone, clay pit, one clay. The oil rig, one fuel, but you had to have researched the oil rig technology to even build the oil rig. Also, it needed to have been placed in the sea, so you would have had to get a sea transport first, big enough to take all the resources out to sea to build it. And the mine will produce either iron or gold. Mines are a little bit special, so let's talk about those. A mine needs to be built on a mountain, and it will produce either iron or gold. When a new mine is built, it gets filled based on what technology you have. So at the beginning of the game, you don't have any technology until you research it. So it would get filled with three gold and three iron. Later in the game, if you were to build a new mine and you had the technology of a specialized mine, you could put four gold or four iron to make sure you had a, a single output from the mine. You could get a bigger mine where you put five gold and five iron into the mine um, and then also when you're adding a new shaft to a mine that requires a technology, and this would happen during the building phase, but you could add your fill to the mine uh, based on your technology level. So keep in mind, the mine is built during the build phase. So what would have happened during the build phase is let's say we don't have any technology. We have to add three gold and three iron um, the game comes with numbers. You could put a number on this and correspond it to a random draw bag. What I do is just turn these around, shuffle them up, and then during the production phase, you simply just reveal one of the resources. So that'll take six production phases for this mine to deplete. Once it's gone, it's out of resources until um, someone adds a new mine shaft to this mine. Keep in mind, I'm sorry, the mine has to be on mountain. Keep that in mind, it can't be in the sea. Um, you can only ever have one building on a hex. So once this mine runs out, you cannot build a new mine, you just have to add a mine shaft to the existing mine. So those are the primary producers. Again, they draw from the land. They'll produce exactly one, on, um, one output every production phase. These are unlimited. They will keep stacking on the tile, and the mine will run out based on its original fill. Next, we have the secondary producers. The secondary producers require raw inputs to produce their outputs. So the sawmill, that's the cost to build it during the build phase, it requires a trunk and will produce two boards as its output. And during the production phase, it can produce up to its capacity, which is six. So a single sawmill on a text, uh, on a t uh, tile, can take three trunks or logs and produce a total of six boards. One converts to two. It cannot go more than that during the production phase. A coal burner can use uh, trunks or boards two of each or one or, or yeah two or one of each to produce fuel and they can do that to produce up to six fuel. Paper mill again can use trunks or boards but they can only produce one paper in each production phase. The stone factory will convert a clay into two stone. The mint converts 
They can do that up to six times. The mint will convert one fuel and two gold into one set of coins, maximum. The stock exchange will convert a piece of paper and two set two coins into one set stock certificate. They can do that conversion up to six times. And then here you can see the different type of, types of factories that actually produce new transportation. Before we talk about that, let's talk about using resources from your transporters and tiles during the production phase. It's important to remember that um, all the producers, primary or secondary producers, will process if they have the required inputs. The primary producer just needs to be on the land to produce. This wood, this sawmill, requires trunks. If in a prior round a transporter had dropped these off and left them here, this secondary producer will automatically process these. Nobody needs to be present. So we know it converts one trunk into two boards. So if we have three, oh, I'm sorry, we have four trunks here, it'll produce up to its capacity. So we know its capacity is six. So it will take three of those trunks and produce six boards. So three of these will go away. The remaining trunk will just stay there because it couldn't be processed because the factory can only process up to its capacity and it'll produce three that'll just sit there for anyone to come and get when they're ready. Transporters can interact with resources on the tile any way they'd like to during the production phase. So this transporter may decide to add their trunks to the uh, sawmill. Resources cannot be forcibly taken from other players and the player decides whether they want to put it in there. The factory, before this actually ran, let's say this one was here, he could have picked this up and put it on himself, preventing it from being processed. But in this example, he's going to let that get processed and that get processed. There's going to be four boards produced. He can only hold two because we'll talk about transport capacity, but he could load two onto his transport to protect them and the other remaining ones would just stay on the tile. So here's an example of conflict. Both these players want to use that paper mill. And we know that the paper mill can convert two logs or boards, but the output is only one paper during the production phase. So this paper mill can only produce one paper, and they both want a paper. So maybe the yellow player calls for a turn order change before this phase began, and they were closer to the temple, so they got to go first. So they decide to use one trunk from the tile and one trunk from them to produce the one paper, which would they would immediately make sure got placed on their transporter to protect it. Any resources on transporters are protected. So there's an example of a turn order that made a difference. Now this um, player could not use that because it had already produced at its maximum capacity for this turn. Just a reminder, every factory will attempt to produce its maximum capacity and automatically consume the resources on the tile. And then any excess tiles, if the transporter wasn't here, just get left on the tile uh, for the taking in a later movement phase. A small point, if automatically producing, coal burners and paper mills will actually consume the boards first before consuming the trunks. So the other type of production that can happen during the production phase is the production of actually new transporters. So you can see you need a transportation factory to produce a new transporter. A wagon factory can transform two boards and a donkey into a wagon. A truck factory, which requires research to build first, can turn fuel and iron into a truck. All the water Factories, raft, rowboat, and steamers need to be built on the shore because the um, obviously it needs to have access to the water. The raft factory can convert two trunks into a raft. The rowboat can convert five boards into a rowboat. And the steamer can convert two fuel and an iron into a steamship. And you can see the maximum output in a single production round is only one of each of these transport types. And it's the player that turns in the resources, obviously they get the transporter in their color. 
Keep in mind there is a limit to the number of transporters you can have in the game. At any one time you can ever only have a maximum of eight total transporters and only five of a particular category, either five land or five water transporters. Eight total and a maximum of five in one of the two categories. If after the end of a production phase you exceed the capacity, one needs to immediately be put out of service. And you can actually only put um, a transporter out of service if it's on a factory, a transportation factory, you can put it out of service. When a transporter is uh, destroyed, um, it's immediately just removed from the game and returned to your supply. And also any goods on the transporter when it gets destroyed are not refunded. So if a newly built transporter and the one that just delivered the input goods are the only transporters at a transporter factory and you exceed your maximum, then one of them has to be destroyed immediately. The water transportation factories have to be built on shore because once produced, uh, the craft has to have access to the water. So for example, a raft factory when it produces let's say a raft factory was right there and it took all its inputs produced the raft the raft is right there on the water technically it's docked to this land tile and then on a future move it can use one to launch into the sea if this raft factory was built on that tile then the raft would be instantly in the river and ready to go on a future movement phase. If, for example, the red player wanted to use this raft factory to produce a raft, but another player had blocked that uh, hex, they couldn't use the raft factory because the raft did no longer had access to the, uh, the tiles because you can never go through another player's colors. Always remember that like the other secondary producers, these factories will try to automatically produce if the inputs are on the tile. So if the inputs were left there from a previous round and there's no, no longer a player there to um, assume receipt of the new transporter, the game will just consume the resources without producing a transporter. The other thing that can actually be produced during the production phase is research. You can produce research into a new technology. Research on the player age you'll see requires two geese and a piece of paper, but it must be accompanied by a transporter. So any spot where you have two geese and a piece of paper and at least one of your transporters there, you can produce research immediately. So basically you would have to immediately decide which of the research, ca research categories you wanted to complete and then just mark that on your research board that you now have that technology. If two geese and paper are left unattended without a transporter, uh, the game will consume them and they will disappear and no research would have been produced. Again, the different types of research can allow you to build uh, rowboat factories, truck factories, ship factories, allow you to uh, build oil rigs, allow you to specialize and fill mines with either gold or iron, to have bigger mines, to add new shafts to existing mines in the expansion. Another thing that research allows you to do in the production phase is to actually upgrade existing factories on the board. So for example, let's say you researched shipping. Enables a player to build a steamship factory. So you used research to do that. As long as you have a transport on a factory, of the corresponding type, so in this case a water transport factory, you can immediately upgrade that, upgrade this to a steamship factory. You have to have a transporter there and a player cannot prevent you from doing that. 
even if they were the ones that actually built uh, this raft factory to begin with. As long as you have a transporter there and now you have that technology, you can upgrade all existing types, either land or water factories, to the higher type. The transporters themselves are not upgraded. It's only the factories that get upgraded. But keep in mind, all of these things can happen in, during the production phase in the preference of the player. So let's take a look at one example here. This player brought two boards here and they're going to convert those using the paper mill. And now they have a paper. In the same production phase, now they can use the two geese and the paper because they have a donkey or a transporter there and they can research and they decide to research the shipping technology that we talked about which then allows them to do a factory upgrade in the production phase. So they have a transporter here and they upgraded a water or they created um, water research so they're going to upgrade this existing raft factory into a steamship factory and now we're still in the production phase they have a transporter to do that a steamer factory requires two fuel and an iron which happen to exist on this tile two fuel and an iron so that player will turn those in to the steamship factory and actually produce this round a steamship that will dock right there on the shoreline. So you can see a lot of things can be chained together in the same production phase. And as we've talked about, during the entire production phase, transporters can freely exchange goods on the tile um, to help in the production. If there is a river cutting across the tile, you would need a bridge here, and we'll talk about that in the building phase, to freely get these resources over here. Or there could be, instead of a bridge, a transport vehicle that's willing to act as a ferry that makes this one contiguous tile versus being bisected by the river. So if the players are willing to cooperate, or if there's a bridge, or if there's a water transport that is servicing the river that's willing to act as a ferry, then all the resources on this tile can be freely interchanged to interact with the building. So that covers everything that happens in the production phase. Livestock reproduces, um, goods on primary and secondary, factories get produced, goods can be transformed into new transporters, you can produce research, and research may lead to factory upgrades. Now let's cover the movement phase. During the movement phase, all of a player's transporters uh, can move once based on their movement range and they can carry uh, goods or other transporters based on their carry capacity. So we can see donkeys can carry up to two items and they can move one hex if there's no road there. If there's a road built, they can move up to two hexes. Wagons can carry three items and move up to three hexes, but they can only travel over roads. Donkeys are the only ones that can travel off-road. Trucks can carry up to six items and can move four times, but again over road. Rafts can carry three and move up to three hexes on sea or river. Rowboats can carry five items and can move four sea or river hexes. And steamers can carry eight items and move six sea or river tiles. The other transporters are used in the expansion game. So this donkey with a limit movement of only one without roads can move from this hex to this hex. Along the way any transporters can drop off and pick up other resources as they interact with the tiles. They can however a specific good can only be moved once. So this donkey could not, however, this could not happen. 
you cannot move these goods here, and then this donkey takes them and then moves them a second time. Goods can only be moved uh, one time during the movement phase. But different goods can be picked up and moved. So this donkey could pick up this board here. Let's say there was a road here. Could take this board, drop it off here, and since there was a road, it has two movements. One, two, to move back. And we'll just draw the roads here uh, during the building phase to show that. Rivers block the movement across a hex. So this truck could, well obviously this truck actually could only move along roads. So let's assume a road was here, it could only go here. It could not cross this river until a bridge was built. If a bridge was built here, and we'll just indicate that by drawing during the building phase, then it could cross to this side of the tile. Keep in mind though, that its movement is based on hexes. So a truck could move up to four hexes. So if there was a bridge here, then this is considered a freely movable tile. So its movement would, would not be one, two. If there's a bridge here, it simply goes one, two, three, four, assuming there were roads connecting all this because this is a truck. A donkey might be a better example since we haven't drawn any um, roads yet. But if there was a bridge here, the donkey could go one there without a road. Geese are considered good goods, so they could be stacked on top of a transporter and moved. They also will follow any transporter that the transporter's owner wishes. So if this donkey didn't have capacity, because he only has two, and we know his capacity is two items, he doesn't have room to load the geese on, and he decides to move to this tile, he may decide to have the geese follow the transporter. And they will follow all along the path in a specific movement. So if there were roads all along here and you had a truck going one, two, three, the geese could follow the truck all the way along the path during the movement phase. Geese can't be left at sea, but if they're not loaded onto a transporter, they're unprotected. So they may have been following this yellow player, but now the red player is in this hex and he or she decides to move here, he can choose to have the geese, one or both of them, now follow that donkey. Or, since they were unprotected, he could have just loaded them on and moved them himself. Water transports move in the same way. It's based on hexes. Keep in mind, when this um, rowboat was created, it was created in this factory, so it was still docked to the land tile. So to move, we know we can see a rowboat in the movement phase here can move up to four on sea or river. So it could go one to this hex, so basically it undocks one, two, three, four, and that could be the movement of this rowboat. If it started here, it could go one and then two to this hex. So it's always based on hexes and it's just kind of docking on the hex. Now that doesn't apply to rivers. There is no docking in rivers. So the movement of this boat, let's say it was here, would simply be one, two, three, four. Or it could go, maybe there was a resource here it wanted to interact with. It could go one, interact with the resources, maybe load some on, two, three, four, and dock with this tile. Keep in mind, once a boat docks, it ends its movement. So if it started in this river and went one, two, even though it has movement points left, once it docks, it forfeits the rest of its movement points. So in order for a water transport to interact with a tile, it either has to be docked or on the river. It could freely interact with all these resources on this tile. It could not interact with these until it used a movement point to dock with that tile. Boats or water transports are not allowed to leave resources at sea, nor can they discard them in any way. 
So if there were other resources they want to interact with, maybe there was an oil rig here uh, with fuel, they could not dump these in the ocean or discard them. We do know, though, that a rowboat, based on its capacity, can carry five items. So it has two right now. It could add to its existing capacity. As we talked about, all transports can pick up and drop off goods as long as at any one point they never exceed their max capacity. So the carry capacity of a rowboat is five. They have five right now. We know they have four move points. So one, they can interact with this tile. They drop off two, and they pick up this geese. So they're still not over their capacity. Two, one, two, and they use a third movement point to dock, which ends their movement, but they could drop off the boards at the end of their movement, and then maybe get this geese and get both geese on the ship with as many of the boards up to their max capacity. And that example applies for land transports too. As they're moving, they can pick up or drop off resources as long as they don't exceed their capacity at any one time. Keep in mind, though, that once a good has moved once during the movement phase, that good cannot be, can no longer be moved uh, by another transport. We've talked about rivers. Uh, keep in mind they require bridges to cross. So even if a donkey has the off-road capability, it cannot get to this side of the tile without a bridge being there. If there was a bridge there, it could go one to go to that hex. Here's another example with an oil rig. So water transports are allowed to interact with oil rigs. So that's one movement to come into the sea. And you can actually store goods on an oil rig. So these goods could be stored on the oil rig to make room for some fuel that the ship is picking up. Um, interacting with the oil rig does not count as docking, so the ship can continue its movement either to future sea tiles or to maybe dock here on the land. If you're docking on a river tile this way, you have to choose which side of the tile to dock with. And since you maybe want to interact with these resources, you would dock there to interact with these resources because you couldn't interact with those unless you docked with those. Only exception, let's say there, let's say a bridge had to get drawn across that river, then remember, this treats the tile as a contiguous tile. So it wouldn't matter which side you docked on if there was a bridge, you could access all the resources on the tile. Transporters are allowed to carry other transporters as long as they haven't already moved this turn. So if this truck had moved into here, it's not allowed to be transported. It could be loaded. But let's say at the start of the turn, the truck was there. This rowboat, since it's docked, can interact with everything on the tile, and then it can transport the truck across the river and unload it. Now, this truck could not move as part of the movement phase since it was transported. Also, you can't transport a transporter with resources on it. In fact, neither transporter could carry anything else besides the transporter. So this rowboat couldn't have goods in addition to the thing. Whenever you're transporting a transporter, it's the only thing you can move. And technically, this truck could not be unloaded until the beginning of the next movement phase. This ship ended its movement once it docked. At the beginning of the next movement phase, though, both can move freely. And also, obviously, water transports can only be transported uh, so they can have access to water or rivers. We talked about geese. They'll follow any transporter. They can't be left at sea. They could be loaded, or they could be stored like any other good on an oil rig that was already at sea. All right, so we've talked about production and movement. Let's just talk about the building phase. In the building phase, that's when we actually build new factories. You can always only have one per hex. Your home tile does not count as a building, so you could have a building here. You could build new mine shafts. You can build roads, bridges, and walls. So let's talk about each one briefly. 
Probably the most important requirement for building is that you have a transporter in the hex that you want to build on. So a land transport in a hex, a ship docked to a land tile, a ship at open sea if you want to build an oil rig, or a water transport uh, actually in a river can build on this hex. So you have to have a transport to build. Only one building is allowed per hex. Uh, that also applies to a river. So even if a river bisects a hex, only one building can be on this hex. Buildings can never be removed, so it's uh, very important to be prudent in terms of where you decide to build your buildings. For the main uh, primary producers and secondary producers, the costs are all located here. It almost always takes a mixture of boards or boards and stones to produce all the factories in the game. Keep in mind that some buildings require research in order to build them. And then obviously the water transporter factories require access to a shore of some sort. We've talked about the mines, um, how to build a new mine. Um, you determine the mixture and create the mixture. If you have the technology when you're building a new mine, you can use a different type of mixture, either specialized, larger. The cost to build a brand new mine is one stone and three boards. The cost to add a shaft to an existing mine is one fuel and one iron. So let's look at that example. So let's assume this mine was built on a previous turn. It doesn't matter if it's been completely exhausted or not. You can always add a new mine shaft uh, to an existing mine if you have the technology. You have to have the new shaft's technology. And then based on what kind of technology you have for the mine fill, you'll basically just add this fill to the existing mine. So let's say I had the technology to add a new shaft. I would need fuel and iron to add a new shaft. And let's say I had the technology to make it a specialized mine. I would add only four gold. So the four gold would get added to the shaft, they would all get resorted, and then you'd have new mine capacity for that mine. It does not matter what the original fill of that mine was. If you have the technology, you could add the new fill based on what you have. So let's remind ourselves, if you have specialized mine technology, you can either add four gold or four iron. If you have the big mine, you can add five gold and five iron. You can add as many new shafts to an existing mine as you have the resources to pay for. So if you had two fuel and two iron, you could add two new shafts to a mine, and then for each fill, you could select whatever fill based on your prerequisite research. Another special example is the oil rig. So you first have to have the research to build an oil rig, but it has to be built in open sea. So you would have had to get a water transport of some sort to get all the resources available out to the open sea before the oil rig could be built. You can never leave resources on a sea tile um, just in the water. So you'd have to get a water transport with all the goods loaded, move them out to the open sea, and then create the oil rig. The last one we talked about before was the clay pit. Remember that it has to be built on a shore, either on a land hex with a river or a land hex that's adjacent to the sea. It has to be built on land but touching water. So we've talked about building new buildings, one per hex. We've talked about um, building new mine shafts into existing mines. Let's talk about roads, bridges, and walls. So roads, bridges, and walls all start with a base cost of one stone. Roads are always one stone. Uh, the hex center has to be adjacent, and the stones must be on a transporter. 
Keep in mind the transporter can always interact with the tile during the building phase, so it may put a stone on the transporter before producing. So this donkey has two stones. It can produce two roads, and this is where the roads are just drawn on the plexiglass. So let's, you can use a dry erase or a china marker. And so it used both these stones to build two roads, one there and one there. It could have built one here too. You don't build a road into the C tile. So from the center of the hex, you build the roads. Now these two hexes are connected by roads as well as this one. So during the movement phase, a donkey could go one, two. So it can move two over roads. A bridge is done in the same way. Uh, this transporter can use its stone to build a bridge over this river. So now this entire hex is considered contiguous and can be interacted with and it's only one movement now. Uh, well, you can get to this side of the hex no problem. And then any resource that was used to build that bridge is discarded. Walls can also be built in the building phase. It takes one stone to build a wall plus an additional two if you're building it from C. So if this ship wanted to build a wall right here, it would have to use one plus an additional two since it's building it from C. A donkey or a land transporter building here would only have to pay one stone and it could be built there. So it can be built from either side based on where the wall is adjacent to. You can always strengthen a wall on the same turn or a subsequent turn. The second level of a wall starts at a cost of two stone, and you could strengthen the wall to two stone. You can never build a wall uh, between two C hexes. So to strengthen this to a third wall would take three stone resources. The reason why you want to strengthen beyond one level is because other players can demolish your wall. Keep in mind, only the color of this player can pass through this wall freely. Other players cannot pass through this wall. They'd have to go around, or they can start to demolish it. The demolish costs are covered here. To demolish a wall, it actually takes two boards. And if it's a two-level wall, it takes three boards, three levels, four boards, and so forth. And there's an additional demolition cost from C that's an extra two boards. So if the red player wanted to demolish this wall, they would spend the two boards. This colored wall would come off, and a neutral wall would get placed in its place. All players can pass freely through the neutral wall. What this represents is the remnants of a past wall. So if this yellow player wanted to build this wall up again, it would have to build on top of this one. So you'll remember that a wall is, for the second wall, it takes two stones. So it would now take two stones from this transporter to build the level wall up. So it gets more expensive as the wall gets built or demolished to do either action. You can also never have two colors on the same wall border. There can always only be one player color of a wall here. You can have a yellow and a red wall. All the resources to build the wall have to come from one side of the hex. You couldn't take a resource from here and here to build that wall. Remember, it's an extra two stone to build the wall from C. If the ship was docked, though, remember, it's technically on the land tile, so you don't have to pay that penalty to build the wall there. There's no additional charge for building a wall across a river. Standard cost apply. The last example on walls, let's say the red player wanted to use that stone to build a wall here. This would immediately kick that boat out to sea. And keep in mind, if there was a raft factory here during the uh, production phase, and we had walls here and here, it could not produce a, or a lifeboat a rowboat because it had no place to release on water. 
So that's everything you can do in the build phase. You can build buildings, add new mine shafts, and build roads, bridges, and walls, and also demolish walls. Roads and bridges can never be removed. All right, let's talk about the final phase of the turn. It's the wonder phase. That's the expansion. So in the wonder phase, players get a chance to add bricks to the natural wonder, and then a neutral brick will be added. The important rule is that the brick has to come based on goods at your home spot as long as you have a transporter there. The first brick costs one good. And you'll remember these are the items that classify as goods in the game. And it's always based on turn order. So the yellow player would get the first chance to contribute a good or a brick to the wall. And they can contribute multiple bricks. So the first brick ha has to come from their home tile and they have a transporter. So they could use this one geese to contribute one brick to the wall. The red player could decide to put a brick if they wanted to. They would put a brick there. And then once all players have decided in turn order, then a neutral brick gets added and that ends the wonder phase and we go to the next round. So let's fast forward and say we're on the second turn now and we're at the wonder phase. So the yellow player gets a chance to add a brick and let's say they want to add multiple bricks. So they have a transporter on their home tile. The first one would cost one. The second one would cost any two resources and the third one would cost three. So if they want to add three bricks, one, three, six total resources and they could add three bricks to the wonder. So one in each spot. We go to the red player. They have a resource to add a brick, but they have no transporter, so they can't do it. So that ends the turn, and we'd add a white brick right there. As soon as the first four rows of the tower have been built, all future bricks, the first brick would cost two. So the first brick to get placed here would cost two and the second one would cost three, and the third one four. So to put three bricks starting in this phase would cost you nine. Two plus three plus four. Remember a solo game starts here. So in a solo game the first brick will always start at the base two cost. Once the first brick gets placed here, uh, all deserts turn to pastures. You can just write a P on those tiles. And the bricks also serve as a timer for the game. So in a solo game, you'll play exactly 20 rounds or 20 neutral bricks. In all other games, once the brick is placed here in a two-player game, three-player game, or higher player counts, the game is immediately over. No other bricks are placed, and you go to final scoring. So at the end of the game, everyone will earn wealth points based on each gold they have, 10 wealth points. For each coin, for each set of coins, 40 wealth points, and for each stock certificate, 120 points. You'll also get points based on bricks you have on the wall. Each row of the wonder is worth 10 points. So you calculate how many bricks you have in the row and how many other non-neutral or other player bricks are in the row. So in this example, this row is simple. I'm the only one with bricks in this row, so I get all 10 points. Even if this was a white, I would still get all 10 points because I'm not sharing the points. In this row, I have two, and the red player has one. So I have two, red has one, so I would score six points for that. So the final points on scoring, the last row of the wonder, even if it's not complete, will score 10 points, so players will get their share. Remember, as long as every player that has at least one brick on a row will get some share of the victory points on the row. To earn these wealth points, they have to be on a transporter, one of your transporters that you control. And in the case of a tie, the player that's closest to the temple at the end of the game will break any ties. And that's everything you need to set up and play Roads and Boats.